People the world over are becoming familiar with the influence that secret societies have over industry, banking, the media and politics in order to bring forth a federal global state. We can identify a large number of the groups involved, such as the Freemasons, the Varian Illuminati, the Rosicrucians, Skull and Bones, Theosophical Society and the Jesuits. But most of the information we have is from America, Britain, France, Germany and Italy, with hardly anything known from Ireland's history, despite its written record. Consider the fact that there are almost as many Freemasons per capita in Ireland as there are in the US, and that the second most prestigious lodge in the world is on the same street as Ireland's Parliament building, Leinster House. Consider also that Leinster House was Ireland's first Templar Lodge, and that the White House was modelled after it, designed by Irish Freemason James Hoban. Despite the enormous influence of secret societies in Ireland, very little of it is known among the research communities who expose such things. So we've explored numerous records to see what we could piece together and what sort of influence these organisations have had in Ireland, just who carried out their plans in this country, and what they're ultimately working towards. In this video, we intend to explore the truth behind the secret society known today as the Irish Republican Brotherhood. They've been underground for many years, but have recently resurfaced in the guise of a benevolent few who supposedly have Ireland's best interests at heart, ready to lead us into a new age of wisdom and reason. However, once you peer past the veil, you will see that this secret society was clandestine for reasons beyond simply evading British intelligence. The issues go way beyond sectarianism and nationalism. The IRB are a secret society with an elaborate set of teachings and doctrine that has its origins in Freemasonry and Illuminism, a fact which is attested to by their founder James Stevens. Their traditions and ceremonies have their root in the same pagan occult rituals, as well as sun, moon and star worship, from Egypt up through Rome to modern-day Ireland. All of this actually goes back to ancient Babylon and has been preserved through what is called the Mystery Schools. On the founding of the IRB, James Stevens said, quote, Once I resolved that armed revolution was the only course for Ireland, I commenced a particular study of continental secret societies, and in particular, those which had ramifications in Italy. I proposed, however, not so much to make a slavish imitation of any known secret society, as a selection of the good qualities of each, and fuse them into that which I was then about creating." End quote. One could argue that this relates to the methods and abilities of secret societies to remain hidden. However, it's not that simple. The IRB drew heavily on the occult traditions and mystical teachings of the societies that inspired them, which we shall detail as we go. The Maguire family who currently head up the IRB in this country are not a group of rebels with Ireland's best interests at heart, but rather an elite family who married into an extremely wealthy and influential family in the 1500s. They were major merchants during the time of the British occupation of Ireland. Today the IRB are infiltrating and luring in Freeman and truth seeker groups that purport to be against secret societies and Freemasonry, and turning them onto their mystery school teachings. We'll return to this, but first we must explore the origins of the IRB, who are its founders, and who are its current heads. Ireland's occult history is one that is missing from the history books. William Butler Yeats, as well as Maud Gahn, were members of the Order of the Golden Dawn, the same secret society as Madame H. P. Blavatsky, who was the founder of the Theosophical Society, and a Luciferian. Another member of this group was the wickedest man in the world and Satanist, Alistair Crowley. The IRB, or Fenians, were an influential occult organisation, a secret oath-bound order with traditions carbon copied from the much older mystery schools, which were active and prominent in the 19th century Europe such as the Society of the Seasons and possibly the Grand Orient. In the mid-1800s, IRB founder James Stevens fled to France with John O'Mahony to escape imprisonment, and while there, set his mind to achieve goals that may sound familiar to anyone who has studied secret societies in depth. They set themselves two main goals, mastering the art of conspiracy and the pursuit of knowledge, or gnosis. At this time, Paris was interwoven with a network of secret societies, and it would seem that the knowledge the founders sought was that of the esoteric kind, if the company they kept was anything to go by. 
they became members of one of the most powerful of these societies and acquired the secrets of some of the ablest and most profound masters of revolutionary science whom the 19th century had produced as a means of uniting the public for the purposes of successful revolution. It's worth pointing out at this time, both the French and American revolutions have one critical thing in common with each other, that being a powerful influence from the Bavarian Illuminati. In France, it was done through the Jacobins, but this was a front for Illuminists to foment chaos and spark a revolution in order to reorganize the governance of the country. This will be important as we continue. Traditional historians will say that the French Revolution started simply because of lack of food and economic problems. And while that's true, the evidence suggests the trouble was instigated and engineered by illuminated Freemasons. It was their first attempt to overthrow a monarchy, abolish Christianity and establish a utopian science republic in a nation state. In 1784, Adam Weishaupt issued an order to a man called Maximilien Robespierre to start the French Revolution by sending a courier from Frankfurt to Paris. En route to Paris, however, the courier was struck by lightning and died. When his body was found by the police, they searched his belongings and found the book he was carrying that detailed the plans for a revolution in France. As a result of this information coming to light, Adam Weishaupt was banished from the country by the Bavarian government, who also outlawed the Illuminati and closed all Masonic lodges. They also issued a warning to all the governments of Europe, telling them to be on guard against this plot. These warnings were unfortunately ignored, and France paid the price. John Rutherford, in his book, The Secret History of the Fenian Conspiracy, published in 1877, claims that IRB founders, Stevens and O'Mahony, were agents of the Russian Secret Service, recruited to create chaos in the British Empire during the Crimean War. According to Rutherford, O'Mahony was to organise an American branch of an Irish terrorist organisation, while Stevens was to organise the Irish branch. Remember what Stevens said, quote, Once I resolved that armed revolution was the only course for Ireland, I commenced a particular study of continental secret societies, and in particular, those which had ramifications in Italy. I proposed, however, not so much to make a slavish imitation of any known secret society as a selection of the good qualities of each, and fuse them into that which I was then about creating." End quote. We can deduce from this that Stevens and O'Mahony had yoked themselves with many of the secret societies so prevalent in France at that time, as the traditions of the various societies were not public knowledge, and would only be available to those who were initiated into its inner ranks. Taking a look at an excerpt from John O'Leary's book, Recollections of Fenians and Fenianism, we get an idea of the structure of the IRB. Quote, the IRB was organised into circles. A circle was analogous to a regiment, that the centre, or A, who might be considered equivalent to a colonel, who chose nine Bs, or captains, who in their turn chose nine Cs, or sergeants, who in their turn chose nine Ds, who constituted the rank and file. In theory, an A should only be known to the Bs, a B to his Cs, and a C to his Ds. But this rule was often violated." End quote. This structure derives from Freemasonry, where occult knowledge is compartmentalized, so the people at the bottom don't know exactly what they're involved in, and could be easily manipulated by the people at the top, which in this case would be the president of the IRB. Marta Ramon, a biographer of Stevens, wrote, quote, Paris in this period was ground zero of a myriad of revolutionary secret societies, some domestic, others in exile from other regions. Their quasi-Masonic pyramidal insulated cell-like structure would resemble that of the IRB and Fenian circles. It was alleged that Stevens and O'Mahony were initiated into one of these secret societies, Louis-Auguste Blanqui's Revolutionary Society of the Seasons being the most often cited candidate." End quote. In Paris, Stevens was tutored in Italian by General Guillermo Pepe, the Carbonari deputy of Daniel Manon, the 1848 Venetian revolutionary. Stevens was also associated with Jerome Adolphe Blanqui, the brother of Louis August, of the Society of the Seasons. The Carbonari was the society that had the most sway in Italy at the time, and its organisational structure would be similar to the one Stevens would lead in Ireland. It's interesting how after joining this society, Stevens went about inciting rebellion in Ireland to attempt to bring about a socialist republic under the control of the IRB. Louis Auguste Blanqui, founding member of the Society of the Seasons, believed that the revolution should be carried out by a small group who would establish a temporary dictatorship by force. 
this period of transitional tyranny would permit the implementation of the basis of a new order, after which power would be handed to the people. A member of the Carbonari Society since 1824, he took an active part in the most Republican conspiracies during this period. He joined the Friends of the People Society, where he made acquaintance with Philippe Buonarroti, a Freemason and friend of the Bonapartes, and member of the Society of the Pantheon, who formed a Masonic lodge, Les Sublimes Matres Parfaits, in 1808, praised as the greatest conspirator of his age, Raspal Carborni and Armand Barbes, as well as the League of the Just, forerunners of Karl Marx's Communist League. These are some of the men whom Stevens would have learned the trade from, whether in person or just in the teachings they handed down. In fact, Marx himself was a strong supporter of the Fenians, so he should be, considering they were operating under the same socialist principles. He said, quote, I have sought in every way to provide this manifestation of the English workers in support of Fenianism, end quote. It is also worth noting that James Stevens, as well as James Connolly, were recorded as both attending the Second International and infamous globalist Marxist Alliance. In the Secret Societies of Ireland, published in 1922, Captain Hugh Pollard writes, quote, In 1857, a messenger was sent from New York to James Stevens, then in Dublin, asking him to get up an organisation in Ireland on resources provided from the States, and it is clear that Stevens had already cut and dried plans in his mind as to how this would be done. He stated his terms, which were agreed to, and on St. Patrick's Day, 1858, the IRB movement was initiated by Stevens and Luby in Dublin. The model secret society from which the founder drew his ideas and plan of organisation was undoubtedly the Carbonari. This society was the lineal descendant of the Illuminati of Weishaupt, which had such a profound influence on the French Revolution. In point of historical antiquity, the Carbonari society long antedated that of the Illuminati, but it was captured by the latter between 1770 and 1790." End quote. Here we learn that the society in which IRB founder Stevens grew to prominence was one that was taken over by the Illuminati themselves in the 1700s. The Carbonari were an Italian secret society that formed out of Freemasonry. They initiated all of their members in occult ceremonies similar to speculative Freemasonry. The alleged aim of the Carbonari was the creation of a constitutional monarchy, and they stopped at nothing to further that cause. They incited armed revolution and carried out assassinations in secret. In the time he spent with this order, Stevens worked his way up to the rank of master. He learned their esoteric secrets, and considering that it was the Supreme Council of the IRB that organised the bloody 1916 Easter Rising, he also learned the art of inciting armed revolution. In his book, Application of Barul's Memoirs of Jacobinism to the Secret Societies of Ireland and Great Britain, R. C. Clifford writes on the influence of Illuminism and Freemasonry on the secret societies operating in Ireland in 1791. Quote, Ireland, ever since the year 1782, had presented a perpetual scene of different associations for different objects. The volunteers had given rise to much debate. The Roman Catholics had been actively employed in petitioning the legislature for the redress of certain grievances under which they laboured, and their prayer was at length partially acceded to. The first appearance, however, of the association which we now allude was in June 1791. The proposals for it are couched in the style and exact terms of the Hierophants of Illuminism. They recommended the formation of an association, or, as it is styled, a beneficial conspiracy, to serve the people, assuming the secrecy and somewhat of the ceremonial attached to Freemasonry. Secrecy is declared to be necessary to make the bond of union more cohesive and the spirit of union more ardent, to develop the plan with ambiguity, to facilitate its own agency, to confound and terrify its enemies by their ignorance of the design, extent and direction. Its ceremonial is also Masonic in order to create enthusiasm. Let every member wear, day and night, an amulet round his neck, containing the great principle which unites the Brotherhood, in letters of gold, on a ribbon striped with all the original colours and enclosed in a sheet of white silk to represent the pure union of the mingled rays and the abolition of all superficial distinctions, all colours and shades of difference for the sake of one illustrious end. Let the amulet of union, faith and honour depend from the neck and be bound about the body next to the skin and close to the heart. 
Masonic secrecy, equality and union cannot possibly be better described. Its members are to be chosen from among men in the prime of life, without distinction of religion, true philanthropists who are not bound down to obedience to that wizard word empire, nor to the sovereignty of two sounding syllables, from among men, in short, who know liberty, who wish to have it, and who are determined to live and die free men. The speech that Clifford quoted in his book was made by the first Earl of Clare, John Fitzgibbon, in 1798 in the House of Lords of Ireland. The Earl suggested an occult amulet to be worn by every member of the United Irishmen, which led to the formation of the Young Irelanders, of which Stevens was a member. And it was this secret society of Illuminists, the United Irishmen, out of which Stevens formed the Fenians. This was only 12 years after the Bavarian Illuminati were outlawed, and yet here they were having huge influence in Ireland, through a society that Stevens later joined, which led eventually to the founding of the IRB. Sometimes it may sound to you like these are the good guys, but remember, they are the ultimate perfection of deception. And they have intentionally made it this way so that they can get people to join them and stay with them until they're so deeply involved and committed that it's too late. And that is why the degrees of initiation. So stick it out and you'll find out that these guys are the greatest liars, deceivers, manipulators, and scum that exist upon the face of the earth. Typhon, in their teachings, is the desire of the few pitted against the good of the many. Now, if you understand what I just said, you understand that these are communists, socialists. They believe Typhon is the spirit of dissension and discord that breaks up unity of purpose by setting factions against each other so that great issues lose the name of action. The desire for riches, pomp, power, and, listen to this, folks, sovereignty, by which this evil genius was obsessed, reveals the temptation by which humanity is deflected from its ultimate goal and led into the byways of sorrow and despair. So now we have a background on the history of how the IRB were established and the character of those who established it. But before we delve any deeper, we must explore the actual teachings of Illuminism in order to shed some light on some of the more unusual statements made by the current IRB president, Billy Maguire. The problem is, a lot of conspiracy theories are thrown around on the internet concerning who and what the Illuminati are, what they believe, and what they're trying to create. But unfortunately, this is done more often than not without any references to their own writings or historic evidence, but rather relying on people like Alex Jones and poorly edited YouTube clips with pyramids and triangles in them. Freemasonry and Illuminism actually comprise of an elaborate occult system, worshipping pagan deities originating in ancient Babylon. The mystery schools are the continuation of the Babylonian religion in guises that conceal the source of these teachings. For example, many people are familiar with Osiris, Isis and Horus, but hardly any will be familiar with the original iteration of this particular trinity, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tumuts, nor that Semiramis, the first goddess in recorded history, was exported to many other cultures with similar attributes under different names. Both Nimrod and Semiramis were worshipped under alternate names after their deaths in their own culture also. Semiramis as Astarte and Nimrod as Marduk. Nimrod was also worshipped as the sun god, whilst Semiramis was worshipped as the moon goddess. Nimrod as the Divine Masculine, Semiramis as the Divine Feminine. This gave rise to the worship of the phallus and the dome and reflecting pool symbols. These symbols became the objects of worship for many post-Babylonian pagan cultures, as concealing the meaning of certain central religious symbols became a useful tactic. Keeping knowledge held sacred by the esoteric elitists out of the minds of the unenlightened masses. This is the birth of the occult, a word which simply means hidden or concealed. The phallus represents the male generative force, whilst the dome and reflecting pool represent the female generative force. According to 32nd degree Freemason and Luciferian Albert Pike, the G in the Masonic square and compass stands for generative principle. Although you'll hear dozens of theories on the internet about what it actually means, this is the meaning according to one of the most respected Masons in history. Also, according to Pike, the square represents the female and the compass represents the male generative forces. Pike is also responsible for devising all of the rituals for the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. So this male-female dynamic is expressed in a number of different ways, but for what purpose? To convey what? 
In Freemasonry, the right angle triangle, for which the Illuminist Pythagoras is famous, has an esoteric meaning that has a lot to do with the male-female symbology. The vertical side represents the male aspect, standing erect like the phallus, while the female aspect is represented as the base of the triangle, lying down in a submissive state. The same as the reflecting pools of Washington DC, for example, while the hypotenuse represents the union of the two, that is, the sexual union. This is the origin of fertility cults also. The divine masculine and feminine combine to create a third entity, the divine child, also known as the Masonic Christ. This is not to be confused with Christ of the Bible, as they are characteristically incompatible. This hieroglyph, representing the trinity of the Egyptian mystery religion, contains three elements. A phallic obelisk, representing Osiris, a womb-like dome, representing Isis, and a star, known as Sirius, representing Horus. Please note that Horus is nothing more than a name for Lucifer, who according to Albert Pike, Albert Mackey, and Manly P. Hall, is the god of Freemasonry. I know that this may sound confusing, but we must explore this a little further in order to understand what the world's elite are up to in order for all of this to make sense. So please bear with us for a little bit longer, as you'll begin to see how this all ties into the IRB, which we'll illustrate using quotations from IRB members and interviews with current IRB president Billy Maguire. We will also be referring to other occultists from other organizations to prove our point. The underlying principle of Illuminism is based on the idea that Lucifer is God and Jehovah is the evil one. This is why mystery schools consistently invert the Bible message on almost every major point. Many Hollywood blockbusters and even video games cast the Jehovah character as the villain and Lucifer and Antichrist figures as the hero. One element in particular, which is a recurring theme throughout Hollywood and video games, is the inverted retelling of the Garden of Eden. This is something which is also done by self-proclaimed alternative historian Michael Tessarian, who was a Rosicrucian and was also raised by Theosophists, has identified himself as a Theosophist, and consistently quotes and sings the praises of other Theosophists. Now, Madame Blavatsky, one of the greatest uh, scholars the world has ever known, writes in this way. She says, the appellation Satan in Hebrew belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all other gods, Jehovah, not in the serpent which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom. Now, even if we accept any variation of Lucifer symbolism, in this quote, it's clear that Sarin agrees with Blavatsky, the greatest scholar the world has ever known, that what we call God should be called Satan, and the serpent is actually our good friend. In this case, he wants us to think that the serpent represents the Lemurians, not women. Lemurians, by the way, is a word that entered into our lexicon through Helena Blavatsky. I would also offer a definition of Luciferianism, which is, Luciferianism can be understood best as a belief system that venerates the essential characteristics that are affixed to Lucifer. I'm not asking you to apply any religious ideas to his assertion that God is Satan and that Lucifer is good. I just want to show you how by any definition, Tessarian is a Luciferian, regardless of what he tells you that minute that the serpent represents. Please note that Theosophy probably has more direct influence in the UN than any other group and it's widely recognized that Hitler was directly influenced by Theosophy founder H. P. Blavatsky. Theosophy also inverts the Garden of Eden story and casts the serpent as the hero and Jehovah as the villain. This same plot is also the underlying narrative of The Truman Show, Pleasantville and The Matrix as well as many others. This theme is thoroughly covered in the documentary Hollywood's War on God. The following is a clip from renowned researcher of the mystery schools and the New World Order Bill Cooper, who was shot and killed nearly two months after September 11, having predicted the event three months prior to it, and that the blame would be placed on Osama bin Laden. Here's the way they look at it. Here's their metaphor for the end of innocence. Adam and Eve were held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, cruel, and vindictive God. until Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from this garden by giving him the gift of intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, 
and will himself become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land. Every secret brotherhood, every secret society, every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. In total contrast, biblical teaching is that man, entrusted with free will given by God, was allowed to do anything he desired in paradise, a pain-free world with no evil whatsoever, with only one instruction. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Many people, the Illuminati included, call this excessive on God's part. But this is without understanding that this tree is the only clear limit God set on man's free will. And according to the Bible, the attributes of God are holy, righteous, and perfect. Therefore, the attributes of ungodliness are unholiness, unrighteousness, and a flawed nature. And the choice between the two was represented by the entire creation on one hand, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil on the other. Out of the vastness of the garden, not a single other thing was off limits. The fruits of unrighteousness and unholiness are fruits directly opposed to the nature of the God of the Bible. If you find yourself in strong disagreement at this point, it is crucial for you to understand that the mystery cults teach doctrines that are likely more appealing to you. They teach that man's banishment from Eden was no banishment at all, but more of a liberation, and that rather than an inheritance of a curse, it was actually the receipt of a great gift, knowledge or gnosis, and the gift of intellect and reason. Hence, to the higher levels of the occult world, the object of worship is Lucifer, who is heralded as a liberator by men who uphold the satanic maxim, do what thou wilt. The esoteric elitists believe that Lucifer represents freedom, sovereignty and knowledge. Before we get back into the IRB, and how all of this is something in which they are intimately involved, I want you to realize two crucial things. Firstly, those of you who find yourselves agreeing with the teachings that we're showing to be a luminous doctrine, you might find the following quote interesting, because it reveals that it is no accident that more and more people all throughout society and the so-called truth movement are beginning to see the light of Masonic doctrines as good and why so many films portray this belief. The following quote is from Theosophist and Luciferian Alice Bailey, who founded the Lucifer Publishing Company, which holds consultancy status with the UN. Quote, there is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time." End quote. The full quote goes on to talk about the world leader called the Great One, who will one day lead a united world into a new age. And the second crucial point is to simply realize that these things literally are the beliefs of the most evil and vindictive people on the planet, people whose plans and purposes are morally reprehensible to almost every person watching this presentation. You shall know them by their fruits, and the doctrines of the Illuminati only ever generate corruption. The IRB are actually strikingly similar to the Illuminists in this regard. Yet again, let's remember what James Stevens said. Quote, I propose, however, not so much to make a slavish imitation of any known secret society, as a selection of the good qualities of each, and fuse them into that which I was then about to create. End quote. Billy Maguire is a direct descendant of the famous Sam Maguire, and if we go back even further, we discover that he's of an elite bloodline, and it's no small coincidence that he's carrying on the traditions of the pagan mystery schools and sun-worshipping cults of Babylon and ancient Egypt. Billy Maguire boasts that his ancestor, Patrick Maguire, taught Christopher Columbus to sail. This is no small matter, as Columbus was a well-connected elitist, and not just any man would be tasked with instructing and coaching him before his trip to discover the New World. History reveals that Patrick Maguire not only trained Columbus, but was the first man off the ship, and therefore the first Westerner ever to officially enter the New World, according to the Madrid Archives. This was a great achievement, and could only have been accomplished by someone of much influence. Well, that's, do you remember I said to you about that um, Ferdinand and Isabella yeah, yeah. asked my family to teach Christopher Columbus, because we had a house and business in Genoa, we knew the family, you know. But um, you know, they, they went down, they were married into the, Maguire's were married into the Duke of Alva's family, who's the biggest landowner still in Spain, that's the Duchess of Alba. Alba, she's the legitimate heir to the throne in Scotland, and the Maguire's, and they were the ones who got, you know, you remember the, the thing about the, the boat, our ship, the Coconut? The King of France and the King of Spain had an agreement with the King of England that these rebels wouldn't be allowed down to Rome. So they went up along to 
what is known as Belgium today, uh, Flanders, Flan um, and he was he they ran Flanders, the Alba, the Duke of Alba. There's portraits of him, and the Maguire's were made into that, and was, he got them down in the old Pilgrim Road down to, and that's what Tiger Queen on. She's the bit largest landowner in Spain. I don't know. My sister met her once. Oh, this is it. Here's who comes going look at that now. I'm trying to look at that thing, which is the sort of stuff that's actually been impossible to find. What were you going to say about uh, Francisca and Isabella? King yeah, Ferdinand and Isabella? King Fer they asked Patrick Maguire to teach Christopher Columbus. Uh, that's all in the archives in Madrid. In the interview we just watched, Billy Maguire reveals that centuries ago his family married into the Duke of Alba's family, allegedly the biggest landowners in Spain, then and now. The Duke of Alba's line was also connected to Christopher Columbus through marriage. As you may know, these elite families don't simply enter into marriage idly. In fact, it's rare for these bloodlines to marry outside of prominent families, and we can see that the initial plan for the voyage was one largely influenced by the Duke of Alba's family, the De Toledos, who had joined with the Maguires by marriage, and were also married to the line of Cosimo de' Medici, an accomplice of Pope John XXIII. Aeneas Silvius, Bishop of Siena and later Pope Pius II, said, quote, Political questions are settled in Cosimo's house. The man he chooses holds office. He it is who decides peace and war. He is king in all but name. End quote. Coming up are some paintings of some of the people and bloodlines we have just mentioned painted with a famous Masonic hand gesture, the Triad Claw, or Marano Hand, which is currently sported in urban America as a symbol for the West Side. The West Side, or Marano gesture, signals the letters M and W, which symbolize 666 from the three Vs. The letter V is Wa in Hebrew and Vav in Gematria, and is the sixth letter in both. Ignatia de Loyola who founded the Jesuits by approval of Pope Paul III in 1539, came from a Murano family from every indication." End quote. We want to stress these points because we can't overemphasize how powerful and influential the families tied to the Duke of Alba's line really are, like the Columbus family, the Maguires, and the Medicis. Their history is dotted with influential royalty, political leaders, and prominent Freemasons. Billy Maguire admits that his family are still in contact with the current Duchess of Alba, whose second husband was a Jesuit. Maguire claims that his sister has even met this Duchess, a woman who had the most expensive wedding in human history and the alleged rightful heir to the Scottish throne. As we referenced earlier, the IRB, which Billy Maguire now heads, was modelled upon the esoteric teachings of European secret societies which founder James Stevens studied under while in exile in France. According to tradition, the first Masonic Lodge in France was founded in 1688 by a royal Irish regiment that followed the deposed King James II of England into exile. Remember, the Maguires married into the Duke of Alba bloodline, which descends from an illegitimate child of King James II, and from that line also came Princess Diana and Freemason Winston Churchill. This is the same King James II who was involved in the beginnings of France's esoteric traditions along with a group of Irish soldiers, and it was one of his descendants that became the same Duke of Alba who married into the Maguire lineage, a fact of which the current IRB president, Billy Maguire, is quite proud. There's a lot of information here, but it's clear that the Maguire family are not to be trusted, as they have many Freemasonic and occult ties, and that's just the information freely available in the public domain. These ties are made all the more alarming by the overwhelming presence of Illuminist doctrines, which we are about to show in detail. In 2010, the IRB resurfaced publicly, insisting that a way out of Ireland's troubles lay in the knowledge of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and more specifically, in a seal, an emblem, a harp. A harp that is used in an occult ceremony that takes place every year on January 21st at 12 noon in Dublin, in the Mansion House, and more recently, on the summer solstice, a date very prominent in Babylonian mystery schools and other sun-worshipping cults. 
This is a picture of the esoteric ceremony, the turning of the Sovereign Seal, 2011. You can see the gold harp, the Sovereign Seal, at the center of the image. Notice Billy Maguire, head of the IRB and self-declared President of the Republic of Ireland, standing on the left of the image, hat on his chest, gripping the trimming of the Irish flag as the ceremony begins. This is the Masonic handshake fellow craft initiates give to each other. The Mason takes the fellow Mason by the right hand as in an ordinary handshake and presses the top of his thumb hard on the second knuckle. The fellow Mason presses the thumb against the same knuckle of the first Mason's hand. Here are famous Freemasons Jay-Z and Kanye West giving each other the handshake. Note the thumb placed on the second knuckle, an awkward one to pull off by mistake. This is Pope Benedict and Tony Blair, the Duke of Kent, and the Pope again. This is the Lord Mayor of Dublin giving a fellow craft handshake to Billy Maguire at the turning of the Sovereign Seal ceremony. Note the Mayor's thumb on Maguire's second knuckle, again, tricky to do by mistake. The Sovereign Seal itself is a 12-stringed harp. Maguire never makes it clear where it came from, but if we go back into history, we can get an idea. Remember Maguire's connection to the Duke of Alba's line? This is the coat of arms of the Duke of Alba of the House of Fitzjames, descended from King James II of England. The prominent feature is the exact same golden 12-string harp on a royal crest of a British Masonic family descended from royalty that Maguire's ancestors married into. Is it all starting to make sense now? And if you go into Van Rock Mirror, that's the sovereign seal with 12 strings. And if you put that up to the mirror, you see the harp with 12 strings. And that's the harp. The harp is the covenant between God and man with all the information and knowledge for his planet Earth and our civilization. And it's written, look, it's, that's the first string. It's written in Om or Ogham. The second string is hieroglyphics. You know, how man learned to count, how man learned to write music. That's the uh, arc of the sky. It's also how you, how man, uh, you know, the wheel was, you take the wheel, that's the feathers, the wheel, the spokes become, uh, the strings become the spokes, and that's the eye. You tread the eye with knowledge, you tread the eye with, so man can travel the world. That's the, that's the blueprint for the curve. How you construct the curve, that's the ribs, and that's the key to the ship. It's also perfect, it's also perfect proportions. And, and all the technical designs, the grid of the graph, you know, they're all there and that. Everything you want to know about our civilization comes from that. And Copernicus, you, uh, you go back to Tutankhamun, the sun dial, the compass, the wheel, everything is on it. See me turning it? That's the crescent moon. And that's the moon ship that controls all the cycles of life and all the tides. And that grows all your food and biomass. It's the sun ship carrying the sun in that direction. They didn't know where the sun went to at night time. So it always comes up in that. Uh, uh, on, so you have east, that's south, that's west, and behind is the north. So you're never alone. You, when you have that information and knowledge, you always have it. And it's man's intellect and reason. And it's, I told you, that's the string. It's your measuring tape, your crumb line, your straight edge, your, 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 you know, the pendulum. Everything is on it. Um, so that is basically what we, what, where it comes from. And as I said, uh, it's the covenant between God and man for the information knowledge for his planet Earth and our civilization. The, the testament of the old Psalms and, and the Bible and the Quran could not have been written without that. That's um, that there, uh, if you, you know, the grid and the graph and, and how man learned to weave his cloth. You know, everything is on the for your information. But that is the what was here, that's 93 years old here today. It's, it's Anna Domine 2012, because it's the Christian symbol in ethos. It was adopted uh, here when the state was founded. And it's what makes everything legal, valid, and bona fides. Whereas the harp is the national emblem, but it's not legal, valid, and bona fides. And if you see the sovereign trinity, which is down there as well, that's what we put up here. Twelve strings, that's the Christian symbol in ethos, Anna Domine, was 1919. The tricolor on the old stick, as I said, is written in on the first uh, string of the, of the harp. The second is hieroglyphics. And that's how Tutankhamun, that's his sovereign seed with the circle. And if you look at the end, um, um, that's the old stick. You know, you take your string, 
and you make your circle. Once you're in that circle, you know that that's east, that's south, that's west. You know, as the sun comes up, you know, it's very important that it's not lost out of our civilization. It comes from, from Egypt across to Rome. The Basilica in Rome is a stone circle with an obvious god law. And that's how, you know, I said the sun box and the sun box. The mysteries definitely came from the East, and the East in the mysteries still survives today. When one Freemason greets another and he's not sure if he's really a Freemason, he'll ask him if he's a traveler, or if he's traveling, or if he is a fellow traveler. All, I might add, were the same code of identification used by the Communist Party in this country, because communism and the mysteries are the same entity as are socialism and the mysteries. When they meet, and this exchange takes place, the one being queried if he is indeed a member of the mystery religion will say, yes, I'm a traveler, to which the first or the inquirer will respond with, where are you going or where are you traveling? From where to where? And the answer will be from west to east, for the east is the position of the rising sun, where the knowledge comes from. You see, for an early history, it certainly can be proven to have come from the East. And the sun was the symbol of the intellect. It began by being sim the symbol of the unseen God of the universe, and slowly transformed into the symbol of the intellect, the light of Cyrus, Ra, Lucifer. Quote, the three lights at the altar inside the Masonic temple represent Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Osiris was represented by the sun, unquote. Mr. Mackey went a little further and informed his readers that, quote, Osiris was the sun, unquote. In his book entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, Carl H. Cloudy, the author, himself a Mason, connected the sun worship with the ceremonies inside the Masonic Lodge. Quote, the Lodge sets him, meaning the initiate, upon the path that leads to light, but it is for him to travel the winding path to the symbolic east, unquote. The physical sun rises in the east. And the Masons explain that their search for light begins in the East, and notice that Mr. Cloudy capitalizes the word East, apparently in reverence to the spot where they believe that this God resides. The Masons tell the world that they circumambulate, defined as walking around, the temple floor during their initiation ceremonies. Mr. Cloudy explains why this rite is performed. Quote, when the candidate first circles the lodge room about the altar, he walks step by step with a thousand shades of men who have thus worshipped the Most High by humble imitation. Thus thought of circumambulation is no longer a mere parade, but a ceremony of significance linking all who take part in it with the spiritual aspirations of a dim and distant past." Unquote. And it is a historical fact that the Knights Templar also performed the circumambulation of their temples. And he further instructs his readers as to why the ceremony is part of their ceremony. Quote, Early man circled altars on which burned the fire which was his god, from east to west by way of the south. Notice that the north is not included in the ceremony. The significance of that omission will be discussed later. But circumambulation became a part of all religious observances. Unquote. In another part of his book, entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, Mr. Cloudy reported that this style of walking was traceable to the ancient religions of the past. And he wrote this, quote, Circumambulation was the ceremonies of ancient Egypt, unquote. So this practice of the modern Masons is based upon the ancient pagan religious practices of the ancients. So the Masons are telling us that early man walked around in a circle because he was worshipping the sun. Then they tell us that they are doing it for the same reason. There are reasons that the North as a location to be visited in their walk around the temple floor is not included in their initiation rites, and six of the great Masonic writers have told us why this is so. Captain William Morgan offered his readers this explanation with this comment from his book, the writing of which he was murdered for. Quote, we therefore Masonically term the North a place of darkness, unquote. Mr. Mackey confirmed that statement in his book. Quote, the North is Masonically called a place of darkness. And Mr. Pike confirmed the comments made by the other two Masons with this declaration. Quote, to all Masons, the North has immediately been the place of darkness, and of the great lights of the Lodge, none is in the North. Unquote. 
and Kenneth McKenzie added his confirming thoughts. Quote, the North was always esteemed a place of darkness, unquote. Mr. Hutchins became the fifth Masonic writer to confirm this detail. As he said this, quote, As in other degrees, the closing ritual provides a summary of the lessons taught in the degree. We hear in the West the eagles gather and the doom of tyranny is near. In the South, truth struggles against error and oppression. In the North, fanaticism and intolerance won. In the East, the people begin to know their rights and to be conscious of their dignity and that the sun's rays will soon smite the summits of the mountains. Unquote. Mr. Hutchins informed his readers that the North was where fanaticism and intolerance resided. What he meant by this, and what the symbol of the North represents, will be explored later. And the sixth Masonic writer who confirmed that the North was a place of darkness was Carl Cloudy, who wrote in his book entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, quote, the place of darkness, the North, unquote. And the reason the Masons do not include the North in the rites is found in the Bible, in the Bible. The reason the Masons do not include the North in their rites is found in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. Quote, I, meaning Lucifer, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the North. Unquote. The God of the Bible sits in the North, and Lucifer hopes one day to acquire the throne of God for his throne. But until then, the North is a place of darkness. There's a lot to take in in these clips, and we're not going into it all now. We're leaving some of the research up to you, the viewer. But we can say this. Billy says, all information and knowledge of our civilization is contained within the harp. What civilization is he referring to? The Maguires are a family with marriage ties to Illuminati bloodlines, and a lot of information about their vision for society is certainly contained within the esoteric symbolism of the harp. In naming the compass directions, he of course starts with the East, birthplace of modern mysticism, the direction most significant to the sun-worshipping cults of the ancient and modern worlds. East is the direction which astrotheologists faced to worship the rising sun, the illumination of the world. He also calls it Tutankhamun's sovereign seal. Remember that the Babylonian mystery religions which inspired Freemasonry spread into pagan Egypt very early on, and eventually made their way into Rome which became the seat of the pagan mystery religions with the Caesar of Rome becoming the head of the mystery religion. Billy's not clear about what he's referring to here. He most likely means the occult tradition of the harp, and he says, it is important that it is not lost, and that it comes from Egypt across to Rome, and in the basilica in Rome is a stone circle with an obelisk. The obelisk being a symbol of the male generative force, as mentioned earlier. The obelisk in Rome is actually the one from Nero's circuses, which is stained with the blood of thousands of Christians who were sacrificed under the satanic rule of pagan Rome. This obelisk was painstakingly transported from Egypt, where it was originally dedicated to their pagan sun gods. Billy gives us a hint when he says, from pagan to Christian to sovereign. What we take from this is the IRB believe that through man's intellect and reason, man's history has gone through three stages from early paganism to Christianity, then to sovereignty, which is expressed as a step above Christianity. This is the same thing the Illuminati believe, that Christianity is a stage, and now man is evolving out of it and leaving the old world order behind and entering the new age, which is being pushed on the truth movement by these same Illuminists. The Illuminati want to become their own gods and exceed far beyond the Christian God. It's interesting to note that Billy calls this stage sovereignty, which is the idea of supreme and complete authority. It also carries with it a striking resemblance to the satanic maxim popularized by Aleister Crowley, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. The Bible says that God is the only true sovereign and that mankind who don't deserve God are serving the corrupt world system, which is being run by Satan. This idea of moving beyond Christianity and taking over God's role is what the Illuminati was built upon. It is in fact a deception, and the same lie fed to Adam and Eve in Eden. Maguire touches on the Garden of Eden later on, confirming that he believes the covenant between God and man must be the exchange between man and Lucifer, where man attains the knowledge of good and evil, which has destroyed mankind, 
as man is so hopelessly drawn to choosing evil. Bill Maguire stated that the Republic of Ireland was in part founded on the Trinity, but the idea that he gives is distinctly different to the Christian Trinity. Instead of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, Maguire's idol is a completely illuminous trinity of the sun, the moon and either the earth or stars. This is another fundamental element which the IRB share in common with the Illuminati and the Masons. Specifically, the Masons have a concept described as the two greater lights and the lesser light. This is depicted in the Masonic drawing board. The sun and the moon are the two greater lights and Sirius is the lesser light. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, is the light that illuminates the all-seeing eye and this is true of the US dollar bill also. But another thing that makes this interesting is that the two greater lights and the lesser light represent the Babylonian trinity that we have already looked at, namely Nimrod, Semiramis and Tammuz, or the Divine Masculine, Divine Feminine and the Divine Child. That Billy referred to the sun, moon and stars as a trinity is very telling, as there is no other trinity of sun, moon and stars other than that of ancient Babylon and the subsequent mystery schools that continue the Babylonian occult religion to this day. This is actually a perfect example of Babylonian illuminist occultism. Listen to this quote by a famous member of the Occult Theosophical Society, Rudolf Steiner, and compare it to Billy Maguire's proselytizing. Quote, In the third cultural epoch, man had to say to himself, In me are the forces of the sun and of the moon. I am a son of the sun and a son of the moon. All the forces of the sun and of the moon appear as my father and mother. Thus, we have unity in the primeval past as the attitude of the Indian, while the duality that appeared with the separation of the sun is reflected in the religion of the Persians and in the religious views of the Egyptians, Chaldeans, Assyrians and Babylonians, we find the trinity that appeared in the third epoch after the separation of sun and moon. Trinity appears in all the religions of the third period, and in Egypt it is exemplified in Osiris, Isis, and Horus." End quote. And, quote, the third period, the Egyptian Babylonian Assyrian, is a spiritual reflection of what took place when Earth, Sun, and Moon had become three bodies. We also pointed out that the trinity of Osiris, Isis, and Horus reflected the third epoch's astral trinity of Sun, Earth, and Moon. This separation occurred in the Lemurian time. After this followed the Atlantean time, the fourth evolutionary condition of the Earth, in which there prevailed conditions of consciousness entirely different from those of today. Through these different forms of consciousness, man lived with the gods. He was acquainted with the gods who were later named Wotan, Baldur, Thor, Zeus, Apollo, etc. End quote. You can actually live your life in this world without never knowing anything about civilization. You know, that is allowed as well. But for civilization and to build your proper society and how to get rid of diseases and all that sort of you, you have an intellect that's what you're given, that's your God given right. And that's the difference. You can go through this life totally ignorant of anything. Get up in the morning, go to bed at night and eat and drink and that's it. You want to. A lot of people did it for a long time in other way. But today we're what they call the enlightened because since you know two thousand, since Christianity, which we don't know exactly, we call it Christ arrived. We're not sure. But our man's intellect became that you know the difference from wrong to right and you know how to read, you know how to establish things, you know how things grow, you know you know, that's what civilization is, that's what sovereignty is. Billy might have a tendency to ramble, but his doctrine remains consistent throughout his interviews. He is constantly alluding to an inverted version of the book of Genesis, the same version of Eden as the Gnostic Illuminati teach. They believe that man was set free from the prison of Eden by the divine light Lucifer, who they believe is the true God, and it is he who gave man intellect and reason. So when Billy says intellect and reason are God-given, he means the Gnostic God, the God of Freemasonry which is Baal or Lucifer. Billy claims man is enlightened, another doctrine being pushed by the Illuminists, and that since the arrival of Christ with man's intellect, we know the difference between right and wrong. 
The Bible says that it is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that gave man this knowledge. So Billy must not be referring to Jesus Christ, but rather a Gnostic Christ, the Christ of Oprah and of the New Age, the Messiah Christ of Freemasonry. Here's a quote from H.P. Blavatsky, quote, Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and the same time. And now it stands, proven that Satan, or the red fiery dragon, and Lucifer, or light bearer, is in us. It is our mind, our tempter and redeemer, our intelligent liberator and savior. That's the sovereign seas, but it has to have it. That's 14 strings, right? Mm. The, Dovern, the one in Dol Aaron has 12 strings. And you know the one color, when you put it up to the tricolor, uh, it's the sovereign republic of Aaron with 12 strings. And you see the harp. When you put that up to the mirror, you see the harp of the sword tree. It's the trinity, the sun. That's the old trinity for Harry up there. It predates Roman Catholicism. And ours is the sovereign trinity, which is this, the, the sun, the moon, and the planet Earth. That curved side is for measuring the circumference of the sun, the moon and the planet earth, all mathematics. You see the, everywhere you turn, see the pyramids of Egypt? The eye is what, if you go to, to Trinity and you see where Cromwell, he broke the eye from the back of the Brian Moore Harp. That's your knowledge. You know that that's a camera. It's your intellect that tells you. And it's all to do with the four elements, earth, air, fire and water. And, and man's intellect and reason, and man's five senses. That gives you five and four and nine. And the Trinity, which I'm talking about, you saw it there on the thing with Harry. Uh, you see up at the course, was not properly lines. That's the 12 strings. That's what that represents. That goes back to creation. And that's how you live. Everything you want to know. The abacus. Look, that's the sun box and the sound box. You know, the telescope. Everything to do with our planet Earth and civilization. The strings. You see the, 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 the sun uh, being coming down that grows all our by and by and then on the harp is the moon uh, the, the moon beams that controls all the cycles of light and all the tides but every way that's the, 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 the blueprint for the current excuse me <coughs> and, and it carries the sun and the harp comes the other way around carrying the moon in the opposite direction but that uh, Copernicus and Galileo they put the string and they followed that in their imaginations, went underneath and came up the following morning. That's 12 moon going across the arc of the sky, going down. But it is the most fabulous. It is, yeah. It's you the know. only symbol in the world, or yeah. the only people that use as an instrument, a musical instrument. Yeah, national but it symbol. goes, every child in the world who's initiated with that, you know, they can understand that. Yes. And you'll always know it, you're never alone. Yeah. You know, it be, it, it's, it's the only symbol that, that survived, what we say, the Garden of Eden, when the world was destroyed and turned up. That is the only symbol, that's God and the sovereignty. That's what he gave us, how to build our civilization. And it's, it's his planet Earth and our civilization. We want to take a look at two doctrines in particular, the Sonship and Moonship Doctrine, and his Garden of Eden Doctrine. These two, like every other doctrine he teaches, are directly out of the occult. The sonship moonship concept is directly out of the Egyptian mystery religion. The sonship is a boat which carries Osiris across the sky, while the moonship is a boat which carries Isis across the sky. So again, mystery Babylonian occultism is central to the esoteric doctrines of the IRB. Also, the Garden of Eden is undoubtedly the most crucial element that marks the division between the mystery religion and biblical Christianity. It's because the Illuminists are always heralding the giver of knowledge of Eden that we must be extremely cautious when someone like Billy comes along telling us about things like the harp, which he describes in terms of being a catalogue of esoteric knowledge, and that is the covenant between God and man. The only viewpoint that celebrates man's banishment from Eden for the sake of knowledge is that of Luciferian Illuminism, the mystery schools. No one who stands against the Luciferian philosophy can see the taking of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil as a good thing. And Gnostics, Luciferians, Freemasons and Illuminists, who are all basically the same with minor differences, always focus on the word knowledge and drop the good and evil part. Billy is doing the exact same thing. He is just using the harp as a representation of the same esoteric, enlightening knowledge that the Masons themselves are busy externalizing through the media, education and other fronts. You see, their primary goal for the general public is that they become familiarized with the nature of the mysteries, as Alice Bailey desired, placing paramount importance on that goal. 
Many people in the truth movement believe that the knowledge which the Illuminists hold is their big secret, that while they use it for evil, it can instead be used for good. Yet one of the most prominent Illuminists of the last century considered it of paramount importance that we become familiarized with the nature of the mysteries, and now we see it everywhere. It is not meant to be a secret at all. It is this philosophy that they are using to draw us into a new age and a new world order. It's not a secret anymore. It's the very core of the curriculum that they're running us through. People have vastly different interests, films and music, video games, and books, etc. But even within each, there are all sorts of genres, and to effectively familiarize the general public with the nature of the mysteries, you must cater for every class, every interest, every walk of life. This includes people in the truth movement. That's why you have the likes of Jordan Maxwell and Michael Tassarian singing the praises of Madame Blavatsky and Manly P. Hall. All of you who are watching this video are actually included in the plans that are being developed in the world right now. You're not an unexpected anomaly beyond the foresight and control of the elitists who know more about our psychology than we ever will. You've been planned and accounted for, and ever since you woke up to certain facts of the veiled corruption in this world, you have been targeted with yet another brand of the same Illuminist externalization, only with different salesmen who use a portion of the truth as bait and Illuminism as the snare. Given Billy's family history and the strangeness of his inarguably esoteric teachings, as well as the quote from James Stevens, it shouldn't surprise anyone that these teachings happen to be a perfect reiteration of the old Luciferic Mystery School doctrines held to by those who have used revolution to overthrow the old orders and bring in the new. This is the meaning of the double-headed eagle and of the phoenix. The phoenix, perishing in flames, rises again from its own ashes. Out of the death of the old age comes the new age. This is a crucial point, that as the Illuminati controlled Jacobins fomented and directed revolution in France to shift the balance of power in their favour, and as the Illuminati directly governed the course of revolution in America, the IRB were the group that organised the Easter Rising on Easter Sunday of 1916. This is the date an Illuminous society chose to do what they do best, destroy the old orders and bring in the new. But something which we hope to clear is that there's nothing new under the sun, the moon or the stars. None of this is worth knowing at all, unless it leads to the underlying truth of what's really being hidden, something that the world works so hard to suppress. There is something which the mainstream media, the majority of formal accredited education, the Illuminists, the Masons, the Jesuits, the world at large, and the truth movement are coming into unanimous agreement about. Keep in mind that while the truth movement is at enmity with all the other groups just mentioned, it's in full, unquestioning agreement with them about Jesus Christ and the Bible. If you think that this is something we just plucked out of the air, then you've not studied your enemy nearly enough. All of this centers ultimately around one thing, and branches out into various other elements, all of which are directly related, and that is, what happened in Eden? Who was the good guy and who was the bad guy? Was man blessed in covenant relationship with God, as Billy keeps saying, or was man cursed? Do you side with the Illuminists in answering these questions, or with the people against whom the entire fallen world is uniting? Which brings us to the closing section of this film. We often hear Jesus Christ referred to as the Lamb of God, and we hear of him dying, shedding his blood on a cross, and that this somehow grants us forgiveness for our sins. But what does that actually mean? In the Old Testament, God instituted the sacrifice of lambs for the forgiveness of sins. He is perfectly just and holy, and will bring into judgment every single unrighteous deed, word, and intention, leaving no sin unpunished. But he is also rich in mercy. His word says that the wages of sin is death, and yet there is a multitude that no man can number which will never taste of that death. How is it then that he can forgive sins when he must punish them? And the Bible is clear that no one has ever earned forgiveness, nor can they. The Hebrew lamb sacrifices were just a picture of what was to come. They sacrificed perfect lambs without spot or blemish as a substitute for the sins of the people, and Jesus Christ was also perfect before God, having lived every moment of his life perfectly and fulfilling the law which judges to an impossibly high standard, and all men have broken that law.
we must also be perfect without spot or blemish in order to stand in the presence of god but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god we have hated him in word deed and in our hearts we have even failed by the standards of our own conscience having all done countless things that we are ashamed of when we knew before doing them that they were wrong but did them anyway the satanic maxim do what thou wilt has become the guiding principle of our lives in john three sixteen the most well-known verse in the Bible, it says, quote, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, End quote. The word believe, in the original Greek, means to rely upon, to depend on, to entrust to. Whoever relies upon Christ in faith will not perish. But how and why is that? What did he do? As I said before, we must be perfect before God, but we have all sinned. I also said that the law is impossible for us to keep, but that Christ fulfilled it perfectly, obedient to his death. Christ's righteousness is credited to those who believe in him, and in his death he bore the full penalty for the sins of every person who would ever repent. That means all suffering, the shame, the guilt, and the just wrath of God. It was an exchange. He took our sins unto himself, and in exchange he gave us his righteousness. So now, covered by the righteousness and the blood of the Lamb of God, we who repent and believe in him can stand in his presence, no longer the enemies of God. But his word is very clear. If we try to rely on our righteousness, our works, we are trying to give him a gift made with bloody hands, and he will not show mercy for it. We have all sinned against an infinitely holy God and the punishment is therefore infinite. Your blood is not sufficient to pay the debt, and there will be no end to the wrath which God has for you. If you want to rely on your own righteousness, you will be relying on something that has no power to save you. Only a perfect righteousness can save you, and no one has ever earned that except Christ. All religion tells us to change your actions, that your heart might be cleansed, but God changes the heart, and after that our actions begin to change. He makes us holy, not us. But you must repent and believe in Christ. Jesus said, quote, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. End quote. Repentance means changing your mind about sin and evil and accepting what God's word says about it. But it also involves forsaking your sin. If you seek forgiveness without repenting of your sins, it's like holding your hands in a fire while asking him to heal you or rolling around in a pigsty while asking him to clean you. Just let go of your evils. Don't try to carry them anymore. The world is under the sway of the evil one, and none of man's works will prevail against him. Not the truth movement, not the IRB, not Irish nationalism, nor socialism, not secret societies, not environmentalism, not the New Age, nor any religion. Christ Jesus has already defeated death, sin and evil and is waiting until his enemies are made his footstool when his victory will be made fully manifest we simply have to repent of our sins idolatry vain works and false religions and depend on the righteousness and sacrifice of jesus christ for our forgiveness there is no other way jesus said quote i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me end quote Remember, all religions depend on your righteousness. Christians depend on the righteousness of God. So repent and believe on Christ and you will be saved.